This is a movie you may have missed, but these performances are killer. Yeah, but those paramedics also sucked. <laughs> they did. Like, they showed up and they're just like, oh, they're dead, huh? Yeah, mustache guy just like went back into the ambulance yeah. for a sandwich or something. I'm like, what the fuck? He's a cop that just got shot through the fucking chest. Could you try? Could you try to help him out? Yeah, it's true. Remember when we first met John McClane? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash, a little too skinny for my taste, Avila. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally... Subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Lovecraft Country, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information and our past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. Finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, please follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShatTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and special events. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? Uh, So, Gene, this week, one of our listeners, Darren, from all the way in Australia, said, I would love for you guys to commission the 1990 crime thriller Internal Affairs. And Darren wrote in and said, Dear Shat Crew, thanks for accepting my commission of Mike Figgis' 1990 cop drama Internal Affairs. I have been a listener for quite some time and love the show. Thanks for all of your hard work. It is much appreciated. I don't present internal affairs as any kind of masterpiece, but rather as just a way of giving back to you for the hours of entertainment you have provided me with since I first tuned in back in October 2016 for Die Hard. That said, I do think that internal affairs is a lot to recommend. It certainly catches some solid actors, most notably Gear and Garcia, at the peak of their powers. In the same year that he starred in The Very Different Pretty Woman, I think that Gear's performance as the sleazy Machiavellian Dennis Peck is excellent, really capitalizing on that intensity that he can bring to roles. I like, too, how the film has some of the leftovers of the slick 80s cop stuff like Miami Vice, but also some of the dark and dangerous tones of cop films that would come later, such as Training Day and End of Watch. It's unfortunate that the treatment of the female characters and the presentation of race haven't aged that well, but I think the gritty action scenes are good and that the overall tone of menace and tension is cleverly maintained. I saw it at the movies back in 90 as a university student, and my opinion of it as an underrated and effective thriller has remained ever since. Anyway, enough of what I think. Over to you. Thanks again for your great work, Darren. You know, there was something I couldn't quite put my finger on when I was watching Internal Affairs as to why I enjoyed it. And we'll talk a lot about why specifically we enjoyed it. But one thing I miss that Darren points out is that when we go back and watch 80s movies, sometimes the villains are just fucking goofy. Like, mm. and you're like, how is anyone ever taking this guy seriously? How is this guy? I mean, think about like Commando, right? Like, what? why is everyone taking this seriously? But Peck is like, yeah, no, that's like a legit villain. Like, it's like we yes. finally opened the door to guys that... And gals that terrified us. Yep, totally agree. Well, Internal Affairs is a 1990 crime thriller directed by Mike Figgis. It stars Richard Gere as Dennis Peck, a suave womanizer, clever manipulator, and corrupt policeman who uses his fellow officers as pawns for his own nefarious purposes while showing a tender side as his devoted father. Andy Garcia plays Raymond Avia, the internal affairs agent who discovers that Peck is not the poster boy police officer that the precinct has made him out to be. Internal affairs is included in the 2004 New York Times guide to the best 1000 movies ever made. Big D, Ash, we always ask the question, what are your memories of the movie we're covering? And we'll start with you, Ash. What are your memories of internal affairs? 
So I loved Richard Gere movies growing up. He's always been an actor that I really enjoy. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but I have this really soft spot, like guilty pleasure for First Night, where he plays Lancelot. And it's not the greatest movie, but it's also a really great movie. And I loved him in Pretty Woman. And somehow, though, I, I missed this one. I don't think I'd ever heard of Internal Affairs. And I love a good cop procedure. I, they're some of my favorite movies, like a genre that I really enjoy, especially like the corrupt cop procedural film. And I really loved Gear. I like Andy Garcia. And so I was pretty excited to get to watch this one. Yeah, Ash, between about 1990 and 1993, there was this series of movies that came out and Darren kind of pointed out like this darker tone to films. Uh, I was about you know 10 to 12 years old during those years. And so there's a series of movies that I call like around the wall movies. And this is like Basic Instinct, Bonfire of the Vanities. It's movies that my family would rent and they would wait until I was in bed as a kid. They put me to bed and then uh, they would go and watch these movies. All the lights in the house were off, and I would always sneak down the hallway to that mysterious uh, forbidden blue light to go see what's going on. And I would have to peek in like two second increments around the corner to see like what the hell was going on. And if a movie was playing during that time, so like after 10 p.m., I knew that it was probably going to be scary and it was probably going to be violent. And I didn't really like either of those things as a 10 year old. But it was forbidden. And that made it exciting. So I've seen internal affairs in two second increments while dodging the gaze of my family. Uh, so I agree with you, Gene. I think and also Darren is that the 90s and 80s particularly, there was a different tone. There was a string of so many bad cop movies. Cop movies were usually you'd pair up two oddball partners and there'd be hijinks and <laughs> what's going on? Or you get like a rush hour where they try to make it action. But there was a string of just really bad ones. So at the time this came out, I had never seen it, never had a desire to see it. And I think it was partially because of those bad other cop movies. I just looked at the box and said, oh, it's Tequila Sunrise. It's something like that. And thankfully, Darren commissioned this because this was not Tequila Sunrise. So thank you very much, Darren, for giving me a chance to see a really good film. All right, Big D, Ash, without further ado, let's hit the trailer. I think most people want to be bad. It's because it is bad. Well, we have cops. Except the cops, the guy who wants to do it worst of all. Don't move, don't move. Put your hands up. The internal affairs is the most uh, important division on the force. We have to be better than the other cops. What do you think he's doing? Could be a lot of things. I want you to kill my mother and father. What? You go after Dennis Peck right or wrong and you don't get him. You're dead in the department. And if you do get him, it could be even worse. We're in trouble, aren't we? You know anything about this this kid, Raymond Avila? You have a very pretty wife, don't you? Do you have to kiss every single person at the party tonight? A little skinny for my taste, but they say skinny ones get good. Hey, Sergeant! Hey, what I'm talking about? Who'd you have lunch with? Who'd you have lunch with? Hi, Raymond. Do you have enough for a formal complaint? No. Then shut up! All those friends you have on the force, you don't have them anymore. Police officer! Richard Gere. I'm gonna take care of things, don't worry about it. Andy Garcia. He's a dirty cop. You testify against Dennis Peck, we'll grant you immunity. Did he contact you? Lock the door. Are you all right? Yeah, lock the door. Yeah. Don't say anything. Take it off! Hi, Raymond. Internal affairs. Can I trust you? Of course you can trust me. I'm a cop. During a drug bust, LAPD officers Dennis Peck and Van Stretch assault a dealer and his girlfriend. Outside, fellow patrolman Dorian Fletcher shoots a man only to discover that he was unarmed. Peck plants a knife on the body to get the distraught Fletcher off the hook. So obviously a big topic in the world right now has been police corruption. And no matter what your politics are, you can't get away from it. No matter what news you watch, you can't get away from it. And I think that we forget sometimes that police corruption is something that's been 
talked about in the subject of films and news stories for ages. I mean, really, since Gene, you and I have been born, like since the 1980s, this has been something that everybody's been talking about. And it became the plot line of a lot of some of my favorite films. I know a couple of us have already mentioned Training Day, but LA Confidential is another one that I really, really love. And so as this movie started, And, you know, we see that Richard Gere clearly is the corrupt cop from the get go. I got a little nervous that this was going to be a knockoff or just like a really boring entry into that genre. And I have to say, I was really surprised quickly at how wrong I was. It wasn't like last week where it took 18 minutes for the movie to kick in. It took about, you know, eight or nine. And I realized that this was going to be a little bit of something new. And I got really excited. A lot of times when people write in or call in, they talk about us nitpicking at movies or being too hard on a movie. The decisions that are made in the production of a movie make a difference. And the way they decided to play off this first indication of corruption was incredibly important. It set the tone for the whole movie. So we weren't sympathetic to the officer, to Fletcher, because he clearly fucked up. Like he was in no danger. Mm -hmm. He just fucking shot a guy for running. You don't know why that guy's running. You don't know who that guy is. You just, you blasted him. So you fucked up. And a lot of movies would try to make us sympathetic to the cop. Like, oh, it was confusing. It was a crazy situation. A guy was running at him. He didn't know if he was armed or not. No, that's not, they're, they're telling us clearly this cop fucked up. The cop knows he fucked up, but we're also not totally against the cop Fletcher because he made a mistake and they very clearly made him a young officer They made him a person of color and he's conflicted about the situation. When Peck goes to plant the knife on the guy, he's like, man, I don't know what we should be doing. And Peck makes him make the decision. It takes it from a personal story of corruption about Fletcher to a systemic question of cops covering for cops. And and I think to that, the movie does a good job of showing how shitty the life of some professions are. Whether you are really pro cop, you're anti cop, whatever, you have to admit that it's it's got to take a toll on you to do that or like social work. It's got to be awful. The things that you see every day, you're dealing with the worst of humanity. You're dealing with stuff that the rest of us who don't see it, we can pretend like it's not there. My sister was a special needs teacher in Boston. She was in a really poor area when she got out of school. It was her first job. And the mistreatment of the kids there, I mean, the, she would see kids coming in the middle of the winter who hadn't had breakfast, had no jackets. The parents were addicted or incarcerated, and it stuck with her to this day. She remembers those kids. She tried to help those kids. And Peck lays it out in the conversation when he's having with Van. He says, how many cops do you know? You got nothing. Alcoholics. You're sitting in a small apartment. You're divorced. You can't get it up. You're going to stick the revolver in your mouth. It shows you that this job is not something that you can turn off. It's not a nine to five. And it's got to crush even the best of us who go in with good intentions. You know, over the last year, Big D, I've marched in BLM marches and I've held up the signs to say defund the police. And that often gets misunderstood in the sense that I feel like there's no need for safety services at all. But what you just mentioned is specifically why cops should not be expected to do everything. And I think all of us growing up, that's what you were told. Like, if anything is wrong, you call the cops and they're expected to fix it. I'm like, well, how is one person supposed to be specialized in that many things, right? Well, and, and and that's the thing. When I've done ride-alongs with police, nine times out of 10, when we were stopping somebody, yeah. that person had a mental issue or it was a result of poverty. And the cop can't help them in either sense. So you got a decision to make. You're going to take this guy, you're going to put him in your car, you're going to take him to jail and then let him go? Or you're just going to leave him alone? Or what are you going to do? And that's why I think that a a show like, for example, like The Wire is so important and was so successful and movies like this are so successful because in The Wire season four, which arguably is the greatest season of television of any show of all time, they take this, you know, story of corruption between cops and criminals and they add in the education you know, aspect. And they're in the schools because it's not just cops. It's not just social workers. It's educators. It's people who have college degrees that make 
really low salaries comparably. Like they're not able to progress in terms of raises or in terms of retirement benefits and stocks like other, you know, college level positions are. And you put everything off on them. And I think that's what you see here. And what's so interesting about Peck's character, because he begins to portray himself as like, I had to do it for my kids, which I think is the way a lot of this shit starts, right? It doesn't start with, oh, I'm a bad guy, so I'm going to become a cop. And these things kind of progress after the fact. Again, with cops, with teachers, with social workers, all those types of jobs that are expected to wear a thousand hats at once, which makes it impossible to perform any of those tasks really well. Well, Raymond Avila joins the LAPD's Internal Affairs Division and investigates the drug bust with partner Amy Wallace. They learn that Stretch abuses drugs, has a history of excessive force, uses racist language even under formal IAD questioning, and may be corrupt. It's gradually revealed to the audience that Peck not only has a widespread web of corruption based on extortion, favors to cops and criminals alike, and complicit dealings with pimps, but he also moonlights as a hitman. So the three of us have complimented Training Day, but even in Training Day, Denzel Washington's character, he's a bit over the top. He's theatrical. He's a little bit loud. Peck is one of the most frightening bad guys we have ever reviewed. Crazy and uncontrolled brutality, like a like a serial killer movie or somebody who's just fucking wild like the Joker. You can dismiss that shit, but calm, collected violence It's unnerving because it's somebody who can control themselves. Peck, he can manipulate anyone around him. He knows how to leverage knowledge, things he's done, call in favors. He is void of all sympathy. He does not mind what he's doing to anybody or the outcome for anybody else except for him and his immediate family. But he's in control of his emotions, and it scares me what he's capable of. I would quit the force. The second he has targeted me as like he's going to get me to just leave him alone, I would leave and go far away. Yeah, when we did the Hunt for Red October, we talked about those wasted minutes and seeing the home lives of these people. It was completely irrelevant. In internal affairs, it's absolutely relevant. Seeing him do the little tea party (laughs) while like checking a guy for a wire or like bathing his wife while also threatening her. I mean, those normal dad things. That's what makes him terrifying is the fact that he is like it's a it's a switch that just gets flipped. And not only not only it's not binary, they could be happening at the same exact time, you know, and it's amazing that we can still take this movie seriously, feel that tension, feel the drama, feel the fear generated by the movie when it is in the 90s and unfortunately vulnerable to 90s style. Everyone (laughs) in this movie has a haircut that is exactly the wrong length. Like Richard Gere, Billy Baldwin, Andy Garcia. These are all good looking dudes. Yet for some reason, their hair was trapped in this weird length. It's not a buzz cut. You could get away with that if you just had your head shaved. That'd be fine. And it's not like a professional length or like what you would see now with kind of like a high and tight. It's somewhere in between. I'm like, why the fuck would anyone do this? So I immediately had to rush to all my photos from 1990. Big D, I don't know if you did. We, I think we all had this haircut in 1990. Oh, I I definitely agree. I think it is the uh, Kurt Russell Stargate look. It's that kind of mix between a buzz and something else. But the 90s were just a weird time. And I'm so glad that someone other than me said this because I get pegged sometimes as the superficial one because I'm pointing out bad style and bad haircuts and it was awful. And I was watching this movie with a lot of confusion because a couple of episodes ago, I was talking about how hot Billy Baldwin was. And then Billy Baldwin came on the screen looking like he rolled out of bed with some weird hairdo. And I was like, he was hot, right? Like it started making me really question myself. I was like, Richard Gere, he was like really hot, but nope, not in this movie. And and Billy Baldwin, especially, he looked like, do you, did you guys have the Chia pet when you were kids? Oh, yeah. You remember the one that was the actual <laughs> no. head? Like not the one that was <laughs> yes. like the animal, but it was the actual head. About three weeks into your Chia pet is exactly what Billy Baldwin's hair looks like in this movie. It's not a good look at all. And beyond the haircuts, this movie was a fucking ass parade. Like I've said before on this pod that man bodies don't have much beauty. Like (laughs) women really win in that department. But there is beauty in these booties. Like either this cast has spectacular (laughs) asses or costuming custom made the jeans for each cast member because 
I mean, they look fantastic. And it's not accidental. You can't dismiss it. There's like a two-minute close-up of Billy Baldwin's butt that is oddly placed right before he smacks the shit out of his wife. And you're like, <laughs> they clearly want us to see this man's ass. Well, and like, I know we're hating on 90s style, but it's those early 90s jeans, those Calvin jeans. They did something. They made your butt look lifted, made it look all supple and delicious. And that's what you've got here. And Richard Gere and Mel Gibson are the two asses I remember the most from this time period. And there is this scene in First Night where Richard Gere has on these little leather pants and his ass looks amazing. I was like, there's never a moment that Richard Gere's ass is going to look better than here. And I was wrong because when he's at that tea party with his kid and he gets up and he walks away, it's like, oh, wait, there it is. That's the Richard Gere ass moment. I mean, there's scenes of him from across the street. Yes. And you're still like, yeah. See, and I think that in the 90s and 80s, it was more acceptable. They focused on the male ass. Mel Gibson, Lethal Weapon, Mm -hmm. great ass and great jeans. Today, it seems like the style is sexist. Any sexy style from below the waist, it's almost like men can't do it. Those tight ass fucking skinny jeans look awful. I think (sighs) we need to have some fashion that accentuates the man's ass. Maybe let's make yoga pants acceptable for men. What do you think? I don't know. I think guys' butts still look pretty good in skinny jeans if they have a good butt. Ninety percent of dudes wearing skinny jeans look like Coach McGurk. <laughs> so it looks pretty bad. Well, and we got to see Andy Garcia's ass too, especially when he was walking away doing this very heavy-handed thing he does all throughout this movie. He I don't know if you haven't watched it. Let me try to describe it for you. He holds his shoulders upright and he kind of splays his arms out to the side and swings them really big and walks just with intention. And it's just these multiple scenes of him walking, looking official, walking across the room, coming toward the camera. No way. He's also going away from the camera, looking angry, looking like an actor. And I have to be honest with you guys, every time they did one of these cutaways, I was completely taken out of it because I couldn't stop laughing. As a world-renowned slow walker, I have a lot of respect for Andy Garcia and a, and a bit of envy there. But yeah, that Andy Garcia walk, he does in Godfather 3. He does it in Things to Do in Denver when you're dead. It looks, it actually looks better and tougher when he's wearing a suit, which is yeah. also very interesting. It's like he learned to do it in a suit. Well, Avila's marriage starts to wilt due to his increased obsession with the case. And Peck insinuates that he will make advances on Avila's wife, Kathleen. During a routine patrol in Huntington Park, Stretch is shot through the chest in a hit staged by Peck. Peck then murders the gunman, but the van used in the hit speeds away. Peck strangles Stretch and makes it look as though he's holding on to a dead friend when his partners arrive. Avia and Wallace set up a sting to catch the witness, but two SWAT units arrive on the scene after the sting is leaked. Fletcher and the witness, Demetrio, are killed in the resulting shootout. As he dies in Avila's arms, Demetrio identifies Peck as Stretch's killer. So we've talked about Gear. We've talked about Garcia. We really got to talk about these two guys together because separately, they are powerful. Together, they're a nuclear bomb of friction. Like these dudes glare at each other in a lethal way throughout the movie. I mean, we've seen countless heroes and villains face off in hundreds of movies at this point. And I honestly don't think anyone's done it better. Uh, whether they're trading innuendos at a coffee stand or like swapping threats in broad daylight outside the precinct, you can feel this like seething aggression, violent hatred being contained by like the thinnest thread mm-hmm. of restraint. And honestly, I started kind of inching away from the screen. I was like, I, I was afraid <laughs> it was going to boil over into my living room. Well, and there's one of the greatest callbacks I have ever seen in a fight, which is, you know, early in the film, uh, Andy Garcia punches Richard Gere twice and like throws a hanky at him and says, clean yourself up and walks away with his dramatic walk. And then later on in the film, Gere encounters Garcia in the elevator and beats the crap out of him and then throws his wife's panties in his face and says, now clean yourself up. And I actually said out loud, I went, oh. (laughs) <laughs> you know, because it was such a sick burn, y'all. Like, I mean, in movies, a lot of the times these things don't work because you can see them coming from miles away. But this one, you didn't. And not only did you not see it, you didn't see the one up that Gear has. And it is so good. And I love the way they do the interrogations or whether or not you have these confrontations between characters. It's very real. It's amazing what you can get information wise from somebody when you just remain silent, stare at them. 
make people feel uncomfortable, people start to talk. They start to say things they normally wouldn't. This works in every day. People will start lying out their teeth when you start asking them too many questions. Just sit there and look. You know they're lying, and the person can't contain it usually, and it'll come out. Yeah, and and I have to say, like, that kind of cold style of interrogation that Garcia has, it's really effective. And it makes him a really... I mean, it makes him a frightening good guy, too. He's not like some pristine guy that's, you know, crystal clean and never doing anything wrong. And that really matches well with Gear, who I, I, I know you mentioned how frightening he was, Big D, but he's so frightening because of how cold he is. And and mm-hmm. I think one of the best scenes in the movie is when Billy Baldwin's been killed, or at least he thinks he has, right? He's still kind of clinging on to life. And so Richard Gear picks him up and he strangles him to death. And then the ambulance comes and he acts like he's just you know holding him like he's caressing a fallen comrade and the little nuances that gear plays in that moment from being pissed that he's not dead and how much of an inconvenience that is to then killing him and then being in mourning it's so scary how well he does it and i found myself saying like wow like richard gear should have been the bad guy in a lot more films because when i think of gear i think of like you know romantic lead that's what i think of with him and here i mean he should have been the villain because he plays a really good villain you're 100 correct there were multiple times in this movie that I thought I'd outsmarted the movie, that the movie was doing something dumb. And I'm like, oh, now how the hell is he going to explain he's got blood all over the inside of his arm? How is he going to explain that he was trying to administer first aid? Bam, they hit me over the head that he's transitioning. He's cradling him. He's choking the life out of him as he's begging. And I'm like, shit, how are you going to explain this? The paramedics walk up. He's not even looking, and he transitions to that cradle. It was like a Hannibal Lecter moment. It was frightening beyond belief. And I know we're hyping this movie up, but we're saying, go watch this. This is a movie you may have missed, but these performances are killer. Yeah, but those paramedics also sucked. (laughs) They did. They showed up, and they're just like, oh, dead, huh? Yeah, mustache guy just like went back into the ambulance yeah. for a sandwich or something. I'm like, what the fuck? He's a cop that just got shot through the fucking chest. Could you try? Could you try to help him out? Yeah, it's unless true. maybe they're on the take too. Fucking Peck's got them in his pocket too. <laughs> you want a job at the Galleria, guys? Come on, come to me. As usual, I do have one question, which is why are wives in movies so obsessed with dinner being on time? Like, I've been in relationships where dinner was not on time and everything worked out okay. You just eat it. At another time. I mean, lady, you're married to a cop. He's intensely motivated. He's passionate about his work. He's hot on a lead in a big case on his first job in internal affairs. Oh, I'm sorry. He was late to dinner. Yes, please. The solution here is to get passive aggressive with him. And, you know, you got to take a shower because your routine can't be interrupted. Here's a fucking wild idea. Wives in movies. Why don't you mix yourself a cocktail? Hang out on the couch. Put on some booty shorts, and when he gets home, give him a blowjob to make up for his long day. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, who is that guy? Who is that? Gene? Is he been- okay. What? I have to say, I get this a little bit. Okay, because this is my problem. Food is one of my love languages, and I put a lot of effort into cooking, and food is not good unless you eat it when it's meant to be eaten. And so I just believe that you can call or you can text and you can let them know that you're going to be late. I think Kathy would have been fine if he would have picked up the phone and said, hey, I can't make it to dinner. I don't think that takes too much effort. And I don't care if you're late. It doesn't matter to me if you're late, but if you don't tell me you're going to be late... That's when I get angry. See, but Gene, I think that dinner is a metaphor for sharing. She wants him to communicate. Yes, he's had a break on the case, right? But he's not letting her know that. When they come home, she talks about her job and he just shuts off. If he said, hey, guess what? I think I got this big corrupt cop. There's been a murder. There's all this stuff going on. My job is stressful. She feels like they're sharing. It's like they're sharing a meal communication's important. And I think that leads to another thing that this movie does really well. The seeds of doubt will be the death knoll for any kind of relationship. Once you start to get suspicious, you start to fulfill the prophecy. You act different. 
they see you acting different, then they start to act different themselves. It spirals out of control. Once trust is lost, you it's almost impossible to save a relationship. Okay, so I got a question for you guys, my my esteemed married friends. Yes. Uh, I've been in, I think, six like serious relationships, and I've never suspected a partner of cheating. Does that mean a partner has cheated on me, and I just missed it? Like, st- like just j- statistically speaking here. Well, my take on it, right, is that if I'm trustworthy, I'm more trusting of them, okay? W- when I get suspicious, it's usually when I'm doing something wrong. And that's not in my my current marriage because I've never cheated. I like that Big D gives this, like, nuanced response. Ash is just violently shaking her head, yes. Yeah, I think that you've obviously had somebody cheat on you. I think everybody's had somebody cheat on them. Well, no, I mean, of course, do it. And then you get into the whole argument of what is cheating, right? They may not have been having sex with somebody else, but. Like, maybe they they went to a dinner after an art show with the guy, and he had, like, super curly hair, and then they just grabbed each other's thighs under the table. Mm -hmm. Definitely that. Listeners, I know I'm mixing three different scenes. That's the joke. (laughs) Don't write in. Not right in anyway. Peck meets Kathleen in a public place, posing as an IAD investigator and feigning worries about Avia's well-being. This angers Avia, who has an outburst at the office. He is taken off guard in the elevator and beaten by Peck, who deceitfully boasts that he seduced and pleasured Kathleen with anal sex. Ooh. Avia then has a violent public confrontation with Kathleen and goes on a drinking binge. The two make up the following morning when Kathleen convinces Avia that she would have left him long before cheating. So, Gene, you've said your your little issue with this film. I have my own kind of peccadillo here that I want to take issue Whoa! with, which oh, is the flashback fantasy. And this is something that, like, early 90s movies could not help themselves to do. And it does not work for me. So there are these weird flashback fantasies of Gear and Kathleen getting it on. And it isn't something that happened. It's all in Andy's head. But there's this blue lighting. There's this super weird editing. Y'all, it did not work for me at all. And couple that with the way that Andy Garcia's character handles the whole thing. I wish he hadn't hit her. I wish they didn't have angry makeup sex. I just think that they ventured into this cliche that other movies did when the movie was so original up to that point. Yeah, all you have to do is do like a Lumberg scene. That's right. all you had to do. You didn't have to make it. Instead, they made like George Michael's sex videos, like, do, 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 like yeah. overexposed film. And also, where was the anal? Like, if you really want to make this painful, oh, show yes. us the, the anal is the part where I'd be like, Ugh, give me more tequila, please. Well, like a little, little poop smear on the underwear as you mop it up <laughs> no! the blood on the floor. Like position them in, you know, in a way he's like, he's like flicking be, nips yeah. and shit. He's trying to be Prince over there. Okay. But but these movies, they're the making beans. me feel like I'm out of touch. Okay. I, I like to think I'm still currently my game. If I was out there, I'd be able to fucking handle myself. But I don't know. As we do these movies, I'm starting to think I don't know how romance works. <laughs> signs in the movies that i'm like oh she she definitely does not want this the <laughs> absolute alternate the, the opposite is so true it, it, it means like yes let's have sex so andy garcia comes back home right they've been fighting he just slapped her in a restaurant i'm thinking oh shit this marriage is done her bags are packed no she's sitting there and she wants to talk right and he they get at each other and he says if you fuck anybody else, I'll kill you. So I'm like, ooh, she's going to leave. Uh-uh. That means, I guess, let's have sex. And the next morning, Avila trusts her 100%. A- am I out of my mind? Am I that out of touch that that scene would have worked to mean let's let's have fucking angry makeup sex? No, man. Paradoxically, I think the longer a relationship goes on, the less in tune I am with when I'm supposed to fuck and when I'm not. Because I'm, now, yes. if I hear, like, I have a headache, I'm tired, my stomach hurts, anything like that, I'm like, not the time to try right. and initiate sex. Whereas if you hardly know somebody, the fact that they're in your bedroom is like, oh, we're probably going to have sex. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is in your bedroom all the time. You don't know. Exactly. So there was recently a time where I was like, I was rushing for work. She was rushing to work. And I'm like, come here. And I kind of let her know I was, I was, hey, let's do this quick. And she's like, oh, come, I, I got to go to work. And I thought, I'm like, okay, in my mind, I was like, does this mean she really has to go to work? Is this going to be a mistake if I try to do this quickly? And then the old me came in and said, no, no, 
do it quickly because at least then you're assertive. So I asserted myself. We did do it quickly and she was grateful I did. So then I thought, okay, I need to do that more. That sounds like so much, so much thinking. It's like, being a man. You're I, conf- women. I don't we have to ever, think. I don't think. I don't think that much when I am about to have sex. Like I just have it. Like that's right, so but, much but thinking. Tom, Tom is forced to analyze every situation Aww. to see whether what you're saying matches with what you mean. I don't. I'm going to ask him because I just can't. I mean, I'm pretty fucking forward so i can't imagine him thinking that much but that sounds exhausting like that sounds like sex is awful like, no, like it must great, be terrible great. to have sex no, because it's... like if i want to have sex i'm like let's have sex if i don't want to have sex then i don't try to have sex i mean i think for a guy like initiating sex is like stripping off all your clothes and bursting through a door and you don't know what's on the other side true it could be sexy times it could be the whole family like, you don't know what's going to be over there. And you're just like, I really don't want to make a dick out of myself. One, two, three, let's go. Yeah. Mm, exhausting. Aside from all of our own personal challenges, I got to say that Raymond and Kathleen are not okay. Like, when this movie ends, it goes straight to the credits. They don't even say anything to each other anymore because they are fucked as a couple. That makeup sex scene you guys talked about, it shows, like, just how broken – their relationship is they're screaming in each other's faces big d mentioned he's like i'll kill you <laughs> and then they're making out and i had a girlfriend once who would get pissed that i didn't engage in verbal or physical violence when things were bad between us like she saw it as a sign that i didn't care enough to get like passionate about the situation and i'm like yo that is deeply unhealthy mm-hmm. yeah i i I thought it was gross, this whole, like, oh, he's spicy and passionate. Like, in the 90s, that was a smokescreen for he's an abuser, right? Like, that was a, a big thing in the early 90s. But I'm kind of like Eugene. I've mm. had boyfriends that love makeup sex. Like, they they loved it. Like, it was their favorite kind of sex to have. And so they create all this drama so that we'd have to have makeup sex and... Again, I just find it exhausting. Like, I just don't understand the need to have to create shit like that. If you want to have rough sex, just have rough sex. You don't have to get pissed beforehand. Ah, but that's fake rough sex. It isn't. Valid rough sex is, you're, oh, you got to be a little angry. You got to have some passion. In it. Do you? Well, you can have Otherwise, passion without Otherwise, we're just, pissed, we're just right? pantomime angry sex. I mean, yeah. my big turn on is just the pressure of being late to my job at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, now I know how to push your buttons, Edgy. Yeah. It works for you. But I wanted to know where did the panties come from? I kept expecting her to not say they're mine, but then she said, Ooh, those are my panties. So did he break in the house and steal the panties? Yeah, either that or just the easiest way out of being accused of cheating is just being like, I would leave you before I cheated on you. Uh, and that's right, because <laughs> I think <laughs> it's so easy to destroy someone's life, especially a marriage. This one pair of panties, if the angry makeup sex didn't convince him, we don't know where those panties came from. She could have slept with him. Do do you know all of your wife's underwear? Because like, I don't think Tom would be able to look at my underwear and be like, oh, that's definitely Ashley's. Yes. If, if my wife's underwear are no bigger than a mask. Like a, a COVID mask. Ayo. If it has more fabric than a COVID mask, immediately I'd be like, but bullshit, like, not hers. Somebody grabs like a lace black thong and throws it at Tom and is like, this is Ashley's. He's not going to be like, yup. No. Like no. he's going to have no clue. Right. But when Tom brought it to you and said, did you sleep with him? And you show the underwear in the restaurant, you would say those aren't mine. She identified them as hers. No, oh, that's true. Yeah. So it's easy to destroy people's lives. Big D, this is like the fifth time you brought this up on the podcast, though. <laughs> like, did someone do something to you? No, I just want you to know what I'm capable of. That's, that's it. <laughs> you got to plan ahead. There's got to be, you know, a deterrence. We have to have uh, a final measure. <laughs> Not for you, though. I, don't... I feel like this this has become our own internal affairs for, like, chat at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but back to the movie. Uh, you know, most police movies portray internal affairs cops as, like, these snitches, right? They just get in the way of officers trying to do their jobs. You know, Axel Foley's just trying to not be tailed by these Beverly Hills uh, cops. And, you know, uh, uh, Riggs and Murtaugh, they're getting checked out by, by internal affairs. No, you know, internal affairs took the bold step of actually – looking at some of the issues that are wrong with cops, you know, police violence, corruption. 
But it goes way beyond that. I mean, this movie is incredibly ahead of its time in the decisions that it makes. It has a lesbian partner who is on equal footing with the protagonist in the film. It addresses domestic abuse. It talks about sexual harassment. It examines, as we talked about before, the psychological impact of police work. And just when you think it's done enough, it goes a step further and it even went so far as to examine like what it's like being brown in a white world. And as I've matured, I've started to realize that like much of what we consider civilized culture in America, it's really just a shield for white mediocrity. Um, when you go to that Whoa. fancy restaurant and it's got its dress code and the bland <laughs> food, um, it's because your fucking food sucks, you know? Uh, it's the, the <laughs> wow. golf club's traditions, not dancing on stage when you graduate high school, the unwritten okay. rules of baseball that have been kind of coming up lately. Like, I love seeing Avia, who is a man who excelled at everything asked of him in a world that he didn't design. When he finally fucking busts out and goes fully brown with his passion and his rage and his language, I'm like, fuck yeah, now you're living. Now you're living. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I was very much vanilla. I'm very much white guy vanilla, okay? I liked the uh you know the light wood, the birch furniture. I was I did not like very colorful rooms. My fashion was kind of plain. Yes, unwritten rules of baseball. So I was vanilla white guy and yes, it's not as exciting or spicy as Vanessa's Latina side, but we've come together and maybe now we have strawberry together. So the world would not be the same without all the flavors. No, but what I'm saying is like when a black student goes up and has maybe gotten their doctorate, right? And they go up on stage and they and they do a dance. Yeah. And, and there's the gasps. Oh my god, you they're they're dishonoring this institution, oh, you know? Um or 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 like right now with what's going on in Major League Baseball where you got a younger generation, you know, of brown players and the unwritten rules guys are like, "Oh, well, this is just unacceptable the way they're they're celebrating or the fact that they're hitting when they're told to take, you know." Uh, to me, it, it's it's all just a mask for the fact that like white people are just threatened by things that are that are more flavorful. I am going to fucking iTunes. I'm leaving a one star review for this podcast. I'm just hey, you have an HOA, Big D? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, what if they said they could paint all the houses in the neighborhood all different colors? Wouldn't you like that? Mm, no, pro <laughs> probably not. It would look like the favela in Brazil. But yeah, I, I do like a little variety. Or like New Orleans. <laughs> Yeah, give what me the five colors, looks five like. Colors. Everything's different colors. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm from New Orleans that none of that I feel like applies to me. Yeah, you're white folks. You're not white people. There we go. But I do have to say, when Andy Garcia started speaking Spanish in this movie, it was it was sexy. And I love the fact that they chose to not give subtitles. You know, that they didn't tell us what it was that he was saying. You just knew he was pissed and you just knew what he was doing and making inroads. And I liked it. I also like that they cast the Mexican Phil Collins as his cousin. <laughs> The IAD discover Penny handles finances for all Peck's wives. Breaking under pressure, Peck's current wife connects two murder victims to her husband. Meanwhile, Arocas, who hired Peck to do a hit, walks in on Peck screwing his wife. Avia and Wallace show up shortly thereafter, finding the dead bodies of the Arocases. Peck shoots Wallace and flees. Avia rushes home to find Peck holding Kathleen hostage. Unwilling to go to prison, Peck pulls a knife out of his boot and lunges at Avia, who shoots him dead. Avia tries to comfort his terrorized wife. So watching these movies, we often joke about mansplaining in the situation. But I think there's a, a female kind of version of it where they movies will give women this superpower where they can just instinctively, they have this intuition where they can, from a few words or even just a look, they can tell exactly what's on a woman's mind, what she's done and what her motivation is. When they're doing the interrogation of Penny, Amy, the partner's face, we see her. She's off in the background, like right behind Penny. And she's kind of tilting her head to the side like a dog, you know, that's kind of sensing something. And she goes, you're fucking him, aren't you? Bingo. The superpower work. She has decoded everything within one second. She could tell they're having sex. There's no question. Of course, Penny basically admits it. Why do the movies do this? Because it's a real thing. It's called women's intuition. But it's not. Real woman's intuition is wrong 50% of the time. 
It's O. It is. It is. It's it's O. My friend gave me that look, or oh, she meant this, or oh, he meant that. Where they're just completely taking shots in the dark. No. See, this is why y'all have to think so much about having sex because you don't know how to like read women. Because I can't tell you how many times Tom has like worked with someone that I know like has a thing for him, and I have to interact with them once, and I'm like, she wants to fuck you, and he's like, no, she doesn't, and I'm like, yes, she does, and I'm not jealous. I don't get jealous, but I'm just like, no, you just need to know that she wants to have sex with you. And then maybe six months, maybe one week later, he'll come home and go, wow, she made a pass at me. And it's like, yeah, because she wanted to fuck you. Like women just know how to read other women. So, so do you think Tom's a fairly intelligent guy? Tom is an incredibly intelligent guy. Yes. So then why would a, an intelligent guy always misread a situation unless women are confusing? Or maybe we're just complex and you all are not. It's because he doesn't have women's intuition. Mm, He could do with a little bit more, but you guys could too. And maybe your sex lives wouldn't be so stressful. I still like my get naked and bursting through a door method. (laughs) Oh, me too. Yeah. So uh, what I'm learning from the movies is no means yes. Any situation is okay. Hey, the kids might walk in. The kids are awake. My mom's in the next room. All that means Let's give it a try and see how it goes. I'm busting through the you door. You don't chain. have sex with your mom's in the next room? She feels uncomfortable when her mother's in the I, next room. I, yeah, I can't do that. No way. Again, that must be a guy thing because it just doesn't bother me. I said her. I said her. Mm-hmm. Vanessa doesn't feel comfortable when her mother's in the next room, even mm-hmm. though she knows they're over there banging. Ew. <laughs> Um, that's gross. But here, here's the deal. We haven't talked about Laurie Metcalf yet. And I love Laurie Metcalf. I think that she's a great actress. She made the entire movie of Lady Bird work. I think she's incredible. And she's great in this. And my last like kind of complaint about the film is that we don't get an update on his partner. He leaves the hospital and they're like, is she a fighter? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, that's what we've got. And that's where it ends. Like, we don't know if she survives or not. And I wish we kind of gotten a chance to say goodbye to her character because it felt like she got a little slighted in the end. Yeah, she was a fucking boss. Her outfits were amazing. Like, with all the animal prints, there was like a monkey shirt, there was like a bird shirt. It looked fantastic. I actually didn't know uh, Lori Metcalf's name prior to this movie, but I'd seen her in so many things that as soon as she popped on screen, I was like, oh, it's that lady. And immediately, you know, Googled her name because I wanted to know what else she was in. She's fantastic. I mean, I'd seen her in stuff before, but just I just didn't know that she was a thing, like like a legitimate, you know, actress. Um, <laughs> but I love the way that the two partners interacted, particularly in that ambulance scene. Again, typically in a movie, you're going to get if this is Lethal Weapon, it'd be like, you know, saxophone. There'd be no dialogue at all. They're just like in a shaky ambulance and they're looking at each other. And then like Mel Gibson's like sitting with his head in his hands uh, on Danny Glover's you know kitchen counter. But in this movie, we got a legit connection between the two. And when Avia started recalling like the will you run and get me coffee line uh, from when they first met, like I got a little emotional. I was really I was really invested in, in her well-being. There's only two things in this movie that dates it. One, the video quality is absolute dog shit. It did not, you could tell that this was not digital. This was not high definition. The quality of it definitely dated it to 1990. The other thing is the use of slow motion. The movie's going along. It is gritty. It's real. The dialogue's real. The motivations are real. And then you get a character who pulls out an Uzi and we get the slow motion as the people (laughs) jump out of the way of the car like, oh, it happens multiple times. Anytime there's action, you had to have slow-mo and it was just the 90s could not help themselves. Oh, man. I mean, listen, I was glad to have an action scene after all the tension. Like you needed some release, you needed some violence, you needed some shit to happen. But Big D, I felt like I was just at some random lot at Universal Studios. They're like, all right, this is the this is the lot where we jump cars. Uh, <laughs> the SWAT team, I feel like they just took a bunch of guys, gave them like umpires vests and we're just like, all right, we'll run out there, guys. Like, yeah, I'm not really sure what was going on there. Half those guys look like they were like in their late 50s. <laughs> I think Wilford Brimley was among them. I don't know what the hell was going on, but but I enjoyed it. It was a fun way to end the movie. Oh, yeah. When you say end, the movie just ends. You're you're <laughs> expecting, like you said, some resolution. It was like, boom, credits right over the action. <laughs> we don't get anything. And I think maybe that's the beauty of it. Sometimes the movie's just got to end because you don't need to tie up every loose end. And this one doesn't even pretend to do it. 
Yeah, but Ash doesn't know what ends up happening to Wallace. Yep. Oh, she died. She definitely did. No, she survived. No, she's oh a fighter, God. but that doctor was like, uh, I got another See, patient. See, this is to go the to. problem. We should know. It went right through her gut. He said, it's clean, babe. And then she had her little leg tucked up like she'd really been shot. I thought that was a nice little bit of acting there. She had the <laughs> ah pose. <laughs> ah. <laughs> anyway, now is the time where we give our wipe score for internal affairs. Wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your respective But Zero wipes is a perfect score. It is Andy Garcia in a suit doing the Andy Garcia walk forever and ever. Amen. Uh, five wipes is an absolute disaster movie it's uh dennis peck getting his foot blood all over your bed uh, we will start with you ash what is your score for internal affairs so i was pleasantly surprised that this is one of my favorite police procedurals i think now and i'm really grateful to our commissioner for helping us find it um i thought the performances were absolutely stellar as i've said i think that the story is grounded in just enough reality for the most part to make it feel gritty and to make it feel real and i thought the conclusion other than not finding out about what happened to laurie metcalf was really satisfying i think that gear was absolutely at his best i think andy garcia Sia was at his best, and I really did love it. it. It's not perfect for some of the reasons that I think we've laid out, but I would definitely watch this again. And I think it joins, you know, like we talked about, like the LA Confidential and Training Day in this genre for being just a really excellent movie of this kind. And both of those films, I would give 0.25 wipes, if not higher. Um, LA Confidential is probably a zero wipe for me. So this one, I think, also deserves it. So I'm giving it a very respectable 0.25 wipes. All right. There's a quarter wipe from Ash. Uh, I don't know what more we can ask of a movie, guys. Like a truly despicable villain, socially conscious topics, exciting action, dirty sex, really good looking cast with bad haircuts, tremendous performances. And like you said, Ash, a mostly believable story. Points off, I would say the soundtrack was pretty bad. Uh, and also, strangely, people were wearing a lot of clothes in the sex scenes. I was very confused <laughs> by that. I don't know if it was a stylistic choice. Did you know Richard Gere was always in uniform while banging? Oh, it's, it's, it's a thing. Is that women just, like, is it women like him in the uniform? Yeah. But anyway, it was 1990. Guys, let's talk about the fact this was 31 years ago. I can <sighs> forgive some little things like that. So for me, this is a half a wipe. So I agree, both of you. This was a movie that surprised me. It caught me uh, really expecting a very different movie. And instead, I got Richard Gere, who plays one of the iconic villains that I think he lost out. If this had become a bigger movie, I think he would be remembered for his dramatic roles. And I think he could have gotten a whole series of different roles. I'm going to give it a 0.75. Really enjoyable. And I highly recommend, if you've not seen it, and I think there's a lot of you out there, Take, give yourself two hours, sit down and watch it. It'll fly by and you'll be really glad that you did. So as the color of money crowd lights itself on fire, I'd like to announce that Internal Affairs <laughs> has an overall wipe score of 0. 0.5 wipes. Uh, so Gene with a score of 0. 0.50 wipes. That now ties Internal Affairs in the 16 spot. Do I even read these or do I? I know we're going to get the hate mail. I'll just say it. Aliens, Edward Scissorhands, The Princess Bride, The Shining, and Forrest Gump. So it's in the 16th spot. People are going to think we're fucking crazy, but... It's, it's great. It's, it's really a great good. movie. It, the Shining's I mean, not that good. Which one? The Shining's not that good. Okay. <sighs> the Shining is amazing. Yeah, The Shining was good, but it, it's by far, like you said, Ash, the best police procedure we've seen to date. Yeah, that's why somebody needs to commission LA Confidential, please. It would, it's a zero light movie. So thanks, Darren, for commissioning Internal Affairs. We hope we gave it a fair score. I certainly think we did. Uh, next up, we have some shout outs from listeners. Uh, I had a great interaction with Lee, aka Shandy Rage. So giving a shout out uh, there, as promised. And then I have one for Stephen G on May 29th. It'll be his big 46th birthday. And Stephen G is all the way down in Sydney, Australia. And he says he's a longtime fan of, of Shat, uh, and he's really looking forward to student bodies, which I think is probably there's only like four of us in the world who are. It is. <laughs> wait, when you guys fucking I, I don't give a shit. Spoiler alert. That's what we're doing next week. You're going to hear the trailer and you're not going to all know what it was. It's called student bodies. So search this. 
it is scream like 30 years before scream and it is it is fucking gold but happy birthday to him do we also do have a few voicemails this week uh the first one surprisingly it seems like somebody had screwed up a director in a film uh, hmm. i don't know who that was but the the first one wanted to you know discuss francis ford coppola hi um big fan of the show long time fan of the show been listening pretty much since the beginning i'm listening to the color of money episode right now and i waited till the end but you guys don't actually think Martin Scorsese directed The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two, right? That was Francis Ford Coppola. That's it. That's the whole message. Yeah. See, Teddy, guys, it's that easy. That's all you had to do. You just call in. You say, hey, <laughs> you don't really think that it was uh, Scorsese, right? That's it. You don't have to be dramatic. No, but the disappointment in his voice, it was oh, yeah. you, you could feel it. Uh, the next one comes from one of our listeners, Stephanie, who wants to talk about uh, our review of Inner Space and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Hi, this is Stephanie again um, from Knoxville, Tennessee. The last two times I called you, I might have been a little drunk. So hopefully this sober <laughs> Monday week now will be a little better. But I just finished listening to Inner Space and number one, it made me remember Pure Luck. I don't know if you guys ever watched that movie. I don't know why Martin Short is in terrible movies and I still love him, but I do. And I thought maybe I loved Inner Space. And then once I listened to the podcast, I was like, I am remembering this movie well enough to know that it wasn't good. But all it did was remind me of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and then you brought it up, and I was like, oh, my gosh. So I'm probably going to commission that if it hasn't already Yay. been commissioned because I just want to do it. By the way, the sweet sacrificial aunt's name was Auntie, if you forgot. And now I'm probably going to go home tonight and watch Honey, I Shrunk the Kids with my 7-year-old because our baseball game got rained out. I love your podcast. It's my favorite one I've ever listened to. I love, love, love 80s and 90s movies, and the three of you are hilarious, and you make me laugh out loud, and you make my Aww. Monday can you amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you may be seeing some money from me soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. That makes my heart so happy. Okay, take it back. That's how you should do it, actually. Don't even call in about, about Coppola. <laughs> Just call in and talk about Martin Short, and then, you know, commission a movie. Uh, by the way, Pure Luck, 1991 film. <laughs> When Valerie goes missing in Mexico, it isn't too surprising as she's generally acknowledged as having the worst luck in the world. What is surprising is that veteran investigator Raymond, played by Danny Glover, <laughs> can't find her. Then an executive at Valerie's father's company has the idea to send Proctor, played by Martin Short, from accounting to go along with Raymond. And Proctor also possesses terrible luck, so he is sure to tumble into the same mess Valerie did. So if you wow. want to find a missing woman in Mexico, send a guy with really <laughs> bad luck and he'll probably end up in the same place. But he must go with Danny Glover. Even better, the poster. The you in luck is Martin Short hung up by his hands and his feet. <laughs> and Danny Glover is like superimposed on a beach, like crouching down like he's got a loaded diaper with his gun in the air and looking up at Martin Short hanging from the U. No one commissioned it. So I guess 1990 wasn't the end of whoa, movies <laughs> at one more good year in them. No, but Stephanie, please, please, please commission Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's really good. Uh, next one we got is Lucas calling in about Happy Gilmore. Hey, Shaq Crew. It's Lucas from uh, Wyoming. Just got done listening to the Color of Money podcast. Another great pod by you guys. Uh, so I was a little annoyed with Big D and Nash when, <laughs> when Gene made his comment about Paul Newman's upper lip. He just wanted, he just wants to suck on that motherfucker. <laughs> I lost it. You guys, and you guys didn't even make a sound. It was hilarious. <laughs> Anyways, um, used to it. And by the way, Ash, it's Scorsese. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, the real reason I was calling is, uh, to defend the guy that commissioned Happy Gilmore on Click. I can't believe you guys didn't like <laughs> Click. I know it's kind of a crazy, uh, you know, storyline, but I don't know. The, the basis of it is, pretty good when you're older and ah oh, fuck it never mind I, I can't talk right now please don't put this on the podcast <laughs> oh, maybe God. i'll send an email <laughs> no when you say don't put this on the podcast you gotta put it on the podcast all right a couple of things here lucas 
Happy Gilmore was commissioned by Steve, who's from Minnesota, who also likes clicks. So I think this Minnesota Wyoming connection is a thing. You guys also kind of sound similar. That's like that very nice, calm delivery. Um, I got to take issue with this with the Scorsese thing. I said Scorsese on the pod. Ash said Scorsese. Uh, if I watched an interview with him to settle it, and it is in fact Scorsese, it's not Scorsese. So I'm I'm gonna stick up for my uh, pod mate here and say uh, no. That is uh, she she's actually right as always. Yeah, yeah and click, click sucks. Click, click is sucks. terrible. <laughs> uh, uh, our next voicemail comes from the winner of the Shat the Movies Fantasy Basketball League, Don Sauce. Y'all, this is Don Sauce here. I was just calling to uh, say hi. It's been a while. Uh, let y'all know that uh, I. Won the Shat on Entertainment Fantasy Basketball Championship. That's right. Don Sauce is the sauce mist. Not Hot Sauce Steve. Not Flavor Dave. One sauce. Donny Sauce is the best sauce. Um, but yeah. Worked on this one. Thanks for all y'all do. Uh, I wanted to give another shout out to my buddy uh, Calvin. He's another longtime listener of yours, and he helped me come out of fantasy retirement to dominate like the team Don Sauce did. But uh yeah, so for that I'd like to um commission basketball diaries. I'm sure it's about basketball. I've never seen it. Um <laughs> no actually let's do Whiteman can't jump. Yes. Love y'all. Talk to you later. Sauce out. I saw Ash's hopes just go up and then <laughs> yes. fucking nose dive oh. down. So good. Uh, collagen. By the way, Don Sauce did call back again uh, after three hours and six cups of coffee uh, to chime in again on the Twitter discussion of Godfather 2 because the, to tell us that there is no Goodfellas 2. Uh, Goodfellas 2 is called Casino. <laughs> uh, th- thank you, Don. Don Sauce, you are truly the sauciest. And guys, if you are basketball movie fans, you do not need to see the Basketball Diaries. Um, it's a good movie. Just you're a movie fan. You need to see movie. Basketball Diaries. And our final voicemail is about Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It comes from Riley in London. Hey there, this is your uh, best buddy, Riley Cullen. So listen, I'm sitting sitting here at home. I'm watching Mortal Kombat Annihilation, stoned off my ass. (laughs) And oh my God, this movie dog shit. Oh, but I love it. So bad, but it's so good. So what I'm doing is I'm going to ask, Fucking commission Mortal Kombat Annihilation. That'd be so rad. Please, it'd be awesome. This would be my second commission after the Phantom Menace. It'd be rad. So, if you get back to me about that, I'll email you this stuff. But yeah, I'm high. This is awesome. I'm like feeling a wave of emotions. And I'm trying to wake up my neighbors. But yeah, all right. You know, you guys take care, you know. Have a good one. Take it easy, you know. Relax, all right? You know, you guys take care. <laughs> it's so nice. Like, I, I want to relax the rest of my day because you of You absolutely, Riley, can commission Mortal Kombat Annihilation. I think it'd be a great, great shot episode. Yeah, and people, after seeing the new Mortal Kombat, were asking me about it, and I said it was pretty okay. Like, it did its job. Yeah. It, was, it was decent. It was entertaining. And people were like, no, it was so terrible. I don't think people understand how bad no. a Mortal Kombat movie can be. Like, Annihilation is, as Riley said, it is absolute dog shit. It's so bad, but I also love how bad Same it is. Z's. Well, in, in, in the paradoxical world of Shat the Movies, that would mean I would probably like Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It would be some weird, bizarre world, because I hated Mortal Kombat. I don't know, Big D. There's no explanation of how the tournament works, so you might be too so confused don't have to understand. <laughs> there's no, no Selection Sunday or Bracketology? There's no Sun Valley Karate Tournament style bracketing that's done so uh, i'm willing to give it a chance as long as we have a new raiden i see that so that's got to be an, an improvement oh new raiden's yeah. badass and that's it for our voicemails we did get one uh email this week we want to read and ash why don't you take the honors 
Hello, chat folks. I found your podcast when I was looking for a podcast to go with American God Season 3. I like that, so I tried the movie pod, and I love it. I've spent the last three months listening from the beginning. Okay, I did skip a couple that I never heard of or want to watch and not get spoiled. So I've listened to about 97 to 98% of the episodes. I really enjoy the podcast, and on one of the episodes, Ashley mentioned that she played academic games. I had to rewind a couple times to make sure I heard her right. I also played academic games. I grew up in Detroit, and I played from the third grade through my senior year in high school. I never run into or hear about people who played, but I know there were a bunch. From the sixth grade to twelfth grade, I went to the Nationals tournament and met a ton of great people. A couple of my favorites were a set of twins from New Orleans. I think the school was St. Mary's, but it was a long time ago. It brought back some great memories and made me feel a little connected to Ashley. Thanks for the awesome podcast. Keep up the great work. Damon R. So Dave and I, I did play academic games. Um, I played equations and onsets, did not do propaganda or presidents. I was an equations and onsets girl. I went to state and nationals a couple of times. We just have to figure out, you know, timing. I, I only played through sophomore year because dance took over my entire life. But if you played any time at nationals from about 1996 to like 2000, maybe we ran into each other. Maybe we played against each other. Ran, I won a couple thinkers. It's a trophy for those of you non-academic games types. <laughs> it's the thinker statue. So I won a couple. So what's more important to you? What's more valuable? Your dance trophies or the thinker trophy? Ooh. Well, I mean, one of them got her a job, the dance trophy. So Yeah, yeah and their p- her pink resume. House fire, you can only save one of the trophies. They all are going to burn. <laughs> I wouldn't take any. And actually, I don't have any because Katrina took them all. Yeah, I don't have anything, but my brother, shout out to my brother. My brother was like the sweepstakes national champion in academic games like three times over. He was a lot more prolific in his academics games career than I was because he played all four. Never did propaganda or presidents. Gene, you never played academic games? I was a science Olympiad guy. I did science Olympiad too. Yeah. Yeah. Very good at it. Very good. Yeah. Didn't win a thinker though. Yeah, well, you know, if you played academic games. I was in the chess club. Does that count? No. (laughs) (laughs) Big D, what do we have coming up next? Uh, Gene, next week we are doing a movie for Daniel M. And it's like I said, it is called Student Body. So if you want to go out there and just Google the trailer, because otherwise you're not going to know what it is. In this seminal horror comedy, an anonymous killer known only as The Breather terrorizes the teenagers of Lamab High by killing every student who indulges in sex. The long list of suspects includes the school psychologist, nurse, principal, and most surprisingly, student Toby, who's always at the scene of the crime. Toby knows she's innocent, however, and vows to catch the killer. Commissioned by Daniel M. It was released in 1981. And holy shit, I cannot wait to watch this. As a kid, I loved it. And I think it might still hold up to a really good predecessor to Scream, which was a big hit, was way ahead of its time. By the way, this reminded me that we should be letting you guys know as requested uh, how to watch the movies that we're covering. Internal Affairs is on Amazon Prime Video, so you can stream it for free in the U.S. As for student bodies, I'm uh, I'm not so sure. No, I I think that was going to be a little harder to find. Well, thank you, Daniel, for commissioning our upcoming movie. And thank you, Darren, for commissioning Eternal Affairs. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at ShatTheMovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all the information by visiting the website, ShatTheMovies.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all the information on our website, chatontv.com. We're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, and Ash Avila, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. <sighs> Hello, it's me, the heavy breather from every horror film you've ever seen. You know me, first I terrorize my victim by the telephone. (laughs) 
can I choose my murder weapon? A gun? Nah, too easy. Uh, a hatchet? Nah, I always use a hatchet. For this movie, I want something very frightening and deadly. Ah. Then I climb the stairs to surprise my victims. Why do they always live upstairs? This movie's a comedy, so killing's not so easy. Sugarless. The movie's called Student Bodies, so I picked the typical American high school. This is Mr. Peters, your principal. Mr. Peters! You're naked! Yes, Toby. All these years I've been secretly naked underneath my clothes. Meet the rest of the faculty. The shop teacher, the guidance counselor, the janitor with the IQ of a handball. What's he doing? Sex education teacher. This is totally unnecessary, ugly, and gets in the way. Everybody's into sex. Last <laughs> night he gave me a hickey right here. And your mother? She also told me that sex was bad and dirty. Uh, but only with my father. With everyone else, she said it was great. <laughs> I'm into murder myself, and student bodies are going to be everywhere. <laughs> Dead bodies, Amphil. 15 yard penalty. <laughs> Bodies, a killer comedy.